May all beings have happiness and create causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Dungal mepe dewa tampa tang mindra wa ju chik nearing chak tang ni tang dra we tang nung chempo la ni pa ju chik. So good evening to all of you. It's really lovely to see so many of you tonight. And we're going to do revealing life as an experience, not an identity. But it's interesting because I told you last time, because this is part two, and I told you last time that I was going to do James Lowe's stuff this week. But somehow or another, when I, okay, we, somehow or another, when I was, when I went onto my lectures and I was putting everything down, suddenly the pen goes and then I'm writing all kinds of other things down. And so I don't even know if we're going to get that far that, that way, but I think what I've written tonight is really very, very important for all of us. And then I added off to the wall a, a couple of things. And I just want to give you those things and then a story or two. So I woke up this morning after watching all the horrors of war in Israel. And I'm like, usually when I wake up from the sleep state, I'm I feel wonderful for the things that I can remember from the sleep state. But this morning when I woke up, I just had this knot in my stomach and I thought, samsara sucks. That's all I can say, that it's really not easy to live in samsara. And I thought to myself, how in heaven's name did we get entangled in beliefs and identity so that it became necessary to inflict pain and killing and humiliation and death on our fellow human beings in a very inhumane way. And when I looked at it, when I was lying in bed this morning, I thought it all stems down to our believing that our identities are the only way, that this identity, we have to succeed with it. And that if you over there, separate to me, have a different belief, then I over here must fight you so that you can come over in, to my side. Now just think of this in terms of these horrible wars and everything else, because in our essence, we are on the same side. We are all Santian beings going through lifetimes, temporary dramas, whatever you want to say. And there's no duality, no separation between us. We're just living a temporary drama for different reasons of the lessons we need to learn in the schoolroom. And I remember Surya Das, who, who's it's interesting, he had an interview, which I listened to, in which he was a Jewish guy who then became a Buddhist monk. And so someone asked him, the, the person questioning him said, are you a Buddhist? And I remembered this so clearly. He said, why be a Buddhist if you can be a Buddha? <laughs> okay, why be a Buddhist if you can be a Buddha? I remember that. And take the word Buddha out and just call it an awakened being, one who isn't asleep, one who isn't deluded. Believing in an ism doesn't does does that make us need to wipe other people out because we believe in something and we think that's the right way. Wars and death and bereavement and suffering are all self-inflicted. Just believing, because people believe in a self that exists solidly, and that's what makes us do what we do in samsara. And when the Buddha looked at the self, he said it's compiled of five skandhas or aggregates, which I am going to teach you in this, in this series. And Buddha taught that none of those aggregates your form, your feelings, your perceptions, your habits, or your consciousness, none of them exist 
as a form by themselves. None of them exist separately. And they are actually empty in inherent nature. That means they're made up of this happens because of this, because of this, because of this, and they're all things that actually really happen one after another. They rise interdependently. So for me, when, when any leader says, I'm going to annihilate you, I'm going to take over your territory, even in Ukraine, in everywhere, when they say, I'm going to annihilate you, okay, then how do we understand that? Why do we want to annihilate people? Why can't people live in peace with their own beliefs, their own identities, their own everything? And I think that that universal law of hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is such an important law. I know that sometimes Guru Rinpoche takes on a wrathful mode, okay, and sometimes we have to take a wrathful mode on in order to, st the reason for our wrathful mode is not to annihilate other people. The reason for the wrathful mode is to stop you from incurring terrible karma. Now think about that because it's really, really important because when you look at why would Guru Rinpoche really fight all the rakshasas, all the negative forces when he came to Tibet. No temples could be built because these people kept annihilating everything that wanted that, that existed. And when you look at that, it's such an important thing because when these beings take on wrathful forms, they never do it for an ego or an identity. They do it to stop beings from creating terrible relative karma which they're going to have to pay off for many many lifetimes and that's why they are wrathful now this needs to be dealt with in a wrathful way but ego and identity needs to be taken out and when I listened to the advisor to Netanyahu talking tonight while I was having a bite you know he said Everything's got to change. In Gaza and Israel, he said, everything's got to change. This time it can't be taking an aspirin and, and placating. We've got to find solutions. The world has got to find solutions. And if those solutions are made with identities, with ego, which is my subject matter, then they'll never work. And what we've got to look at is that in the beautiful tantra of the sharp vajra of conscious awareness, which Dajam Rinpoche writes all about and gives commentary on, he says there, that word I was talking about last week, identitylessness, identitylessness, which is not identityless, it means that the identity is full of possibilities. There's an essence and the possibilities happen as you go out, many possibilities, but none of them are identities that we hold on to. And I want to just read you this tiny paragraph from the Tantra before I start on all my stuff. It goes like this. The sharp <clears throat> tent Vajra, the sharp Vajra, Remember the Vajra cuts through all the rubbish, okay? It just cuts through, it's a thunderbolt. The sharp Vajra of discerning wisdom. Discerning wisdom is one of the five wisdoms in which you discern the relative from the ultimate. You discern what the truth is. So the sharp Vajra of discerning wisdom demolishes the mountain of samsara, of self-concepts. Self-concepts are what killing us, okay? And he, it says in the Tantra, investigate the origin, location, and destination of the name and reference of that which is grasped as I. I, I, me, not I, I, me, is the root 
which is the root of samsara. So the root of samsara is because of I. I and me is the root of samsara and the cause of all problems. I don't want you to believe in this. I want you to believe in that. I don't like this. This is me. Don't touch me or mine. All of this has caused it. And he says there, decisively recognizing as it, as objectless emptiness, objectless emptiness, which means no object, all the objects are full of possibilities, none of them are solid. Decisively recognizing it as objective emptiness is determining personal identitylessness. Now, I should give you that paragraph because it's a very, very special paragraph. But basically, what he's saying is our whole lives are built on I. I want this. I must have this. I want this. This is the right belief. This is who I am. This is my identity. And in actual fact, all that this is in this life is experiential. It's an experience, not a solid identity. And when, what I was saying last week is when Guru Rinpoche manifests in thousands and millions of different, of different forms for the sake of other beings, not for his own sake, he's always got the essence, the essence which is identitylessness. We've lost that essence. That's how we can take people cruelly and, you know, put them through what, what is going on in this war. We can put them through because we've lost that ability to understand the true nature. And it's very interesting because when I was going to do this talk, I told you last week I would go on to James Lowe's stuff. But my pen was just writing and writing. So I'm going to look at all of that tonight. And I want you to butt in. I'm happy if you butt in. Because if we don't understand this, then there's nothing for it. And I want to just read the story of a pearl. And it goes like this. A single drop of rain fell from a cloud in the sky but was filled with shame when it saw the sea so wide. Next to the sea, then, who am I? If the sea exists, then how can I? While looking down on itself with the eyes of contempt, an oyster in a shell took it in for nourishment. And so it was that its fate was sealed by this event. It became a famous pearl fit to adorn a king's head. Having descended to the depths, it was now exalted to the heights. Having descended from the depths, it was now exalted to the heights. On the portal of non-existence, it went knocking until it was finally transformed into being. Now, so it is with us. The small identities that we have often make us feel inadequate, shameful sometimes. I mean, I listen to people after people after people. I'm asking them, what are you supposed to be doing in this life? You know, I can't even look at psychology anymore. I'm just looking at people and trying to make them get to that identitylessness, not all the rubbish that is around them and in their own lives. And sometimes we feel inadequate, we feel shameful, we feel suffering, we feel uncertain, we feel very small, we feel tight, we feel closed in, we feel lowly. lowly. And yet, why should we think that one grain of sand in the sandpit is the total sandpit? Why do we think the one grain, which is Melanie, Diana, Martin, Pam, whatever, is the total sandpit. Have we forgotten that we've got a total sandpit and this is just one grain of sand? And is there a way to view this total sandpit to see it in its wholeness? Now, tonight, I'm going to really challenge you a lot 
because I want you to understand this thing called identity, how it isn't for real, and how if you change identity into experience, then you are able to get your Buddha nature operating in you. If we spend our whole lives saying, well, yes, I know there is this nature. I know there is this, this big part of me, but I don't really know how to get there and I don't know what to do about it. Then it's hopeless. I just want to do one more thing. I'll throw it open. You can butt in. Just want to give you a get into it a little bit and then I'm going to throw it open. But this story is such an important one that Chang Tzu related. He said, in the age when life on earth was full, no one paid any special attention to worthy men, nor did they single out the man of ability. Rulers were simply the highest branches on the trees, and the people were like deer in the woods. They were honest, they were righteous, without even realizing that they were doing their duty. They loved each other and did not know that this was love of a neighbor. They deceived no one, yet they did not know they were meant to be trusted. They were reliable and did not know that this was good faith. They lived freely together, giving and taking, and did not know they were generous. For this reason, their deeds have not been narrated. They made no history. Now think about the golden age where you make no history. Why? Because if you look at history, sorry, I forgot to put this on. If you look at history, it's the most unbelievable thing. If you look at the news, the news is full of history of people. It's full of rubbish. The nice things occasionally get reported, but mostly, if you turn on any news broadcast all over the world, mostly it's um, mostly it's it's absolutely awful things because those are the things that attract people and that's what what gets them sponsorship on the news now think about the story chang su said about when we would be beautiful to each other about when we would be caring about when we would be generous but it doesn't make history how do you feel about that So when the golden age comes, your time, you're going to make a comment, please. I was just going to say, I, I, I find history, um, well, I find history interesting and I find it quite fascinating. But at the yeah. same time, it's only one person's opinion. You know, I went to a party on Saturday night and it was fabulous. Somebody else might say, oh, it was such a drag. But because I shouted louder, mine mine was the one that was recorded. You know, so that that's that's the sort of the the kind of confusion of history, if you like. It's 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 a point of view. Yeah. It's not the only point of view. Exactly. And the thing is, though, that I've been thinking to myself how much I would love to live in a golden age. And what I love is that the leaders, Chang Su said, the leaders were the highest branches of the trees. They just automatically led because they had more spiritual knowledge. I mean, it makes sense. How did we get our leaders? Greedy, corrupt, egomanias. Wanting other people's territory. Sorry, you were going to yeah. say something, Dan. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say it. It makes it puts one in mind of Joseph Campbell, and um, and men actually society as it's developed over time has a need for a hero, and whether that hero is a spiritual leader or yeah. some some other some other type of leadership, whether it's of knowledge or of painting or of whatever it is we but we do need we do need heroes and we need we we have that that yearning to to belong and to to look up to an example and I think that that's always an important one 
but what heroes have we got? I mean, well, at the moment, they're a little thin on the ground. <laughs> you know what? The point is that heroes are often, oh gosh, I knew that might happen. Sorry, we're still on. Can you still hear me? I'm going to just put this light on for the moment. It'll come all back on. I didn't think it was going to go off tonight because I thought that uh, we haven't had load much load shedding, but we're getting it tonight. We um, can hear you now. Okay. Eugene, can you see me now? The lights will come on right now. Yeah. Uh, Eugene, you Eugene, know. wanted to say something? Hi, ah, Cooks, here we are. Um, yeah, so I think the... So your thing about identitylessness and like escalations and violence and all that kind of stuff is very true because the thing is, is like it's our identities that defines us and then makes us believe that we're, everything is limited and makes it everything a competition. It makes that us and them very clear. And then some people get indoctrinated from birth. And then, like, that, that's why you have these situations. And the thing is, is, like, you can't see past your, you can't see, you, you can't see humanity if you're stuck in your identity. Yeah. Because, because if you're, if yeah. you're stuck in, sorry, I'm also in load shedding, so it's not even helping I put on my camera. But, um, yeah. uh, so if you, if you're stuck in an identity, then it's very much you did this to us and you killed my grandfather back in 1978 um like this that and and that sticks so it just escalates generation after generation but it's also interesting so i would like to get your point of view of why you think Israel and Palestine and that region of the world is in cons constant Upheaval, because if you think about it, it's not Israel and Palestine. It was the Crusades. It was the Ottoman Empire versus the Europe mm -hmm. and the Knights Templar and the Christians versus the Jews versus the Muslims. And it's all the Abrahamic religions stem mm -hmm. from that one piece of earth. And all the Temple Mounts is holy to all three religions. And they... I, it, I don't know if it even goes back to the Tower of Babel. They all stemmed from the same religion, but they went on all three different paths. And us Buddhists believe in that Allah was a Buddha and Jesus was a Buddha. So instead of finding commonality in those wise men with a very similar backstory, Allah was wise, could also debate with the wise men at a very young age. There were also astrological alignment at the date and time of his birth. Uh, he also had high levels of cognition and awareness. He also disappeared into the desert and, and had to flee like persecution because he was becoming a threat. And then when he actually came back and tried to upend the apple cart with the traditions and societies of the day he was an outcast and an outlaw and persecuted so but instead of finding commonality in that storyline yeah. yeah, exactly. it's even more divisiveness you see the whole thing is that until people actually understand that it is their buddha nature their christ nature the Allah nature, whatever you want to call it, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just another name. The enlightened nature will be the thing that will support people through all their deeds. And I think that the Middle East there has been has been that for that very reason, because I think that it it is a sacred spot. I think that Jerusalem is a sacred spot. And maybe the symbolism of Jerusalem is that people have to learn to share it and to live side by side, allowing other people to have their own beliefs and their own commonalities. But then out of that, you get the terrorists who will not even, you know, they, they just want to destroy everything. And that's why the subject matter is so very important. Because, and what I wrote down when I was writing for you was, I said, when a lot of us look at our childhoods, 
we feel a lot of pain with our struggles, our parents' struggles, the feelings it evokes, and sometimes the trauma that we experience. And unfortunately, this often, and I'm going to give you the, the comparison with the masters, this often, and not always, leaves scars. And the scars become part of the small identities that we live in. So sometimes we aren't even aware, it's unaware that of how that influences our relationships with people and our beliefs and our everything, especially our intimate relationship. You know, I always say intimacy into me, you see, okay? And sometimes it becomes shame. Everybody's getting bumped off with the load shedding. Sometimes that becomes the driving force in our day. So, for example, people that had a lot of pain from going through poverty growing up, the driving force, the main aim in their identity is to be wealthy no matter how, you, how they obtain it. But in the meantime, if somebody had poverty, it means that one of the qualities, remember, we've got enlightened body, speech, mind, qualities, and activities the five things. So one of the qualities we're supposed to have in our true nature is generosity. So if somebody went through poverty, there would be no harm if they tried to make wealth as long as they shared it with other people. But the point is, it would be very important for that person to understand that the reason for the poverty is because once before they had what they had and they couldn't give and share. So now they've come back to feel what it's like not to have. And if we don't get that, but the driving force is always to have wealth, it's lost. Or if you had hurt and your parents who are unable to love you, then your later relationships can have a driving force never to get hurt again, never to trust, to watch behind your back anxiously that no one ever hurts you again and nobody and close down your emotions and ne never let anyone see inside you and so on. Now, when we go on a deep Buddhist path, remember we're looking at experience and identities tonight. When we go on a deep Buddhist path, the psychology of our tight identities becomes only one teeny aspect of who we are, who we really are, and who we become. So we learn a different view, that all that has happened to us, we learn that there aren't any victims. Even now, when we look in the wall, there aren't really any victims. Nobody's in that place at the wrong time in the wrong place. We see, learn to see people not in the role they present to us, okay, but in their entirety, in terms of in terms of the awful role they are playing with us to reflect that internally to ourselves. And when I was writing this, I remembered this unbelievable story with a girl I was counseling many years ago, so there would be no identification. But this girl came to me. She was in her bed. She was a young, young girl. She was probably maybe 19 or 20. And she was in her bed and she'd left the window open. And this guy climbed through the window and raped her. Okay. But what happened? So what happened was that rape story became the actual content of her whole life. I mean, from then on. She never trusted, she didn't want any men in her life. That rape became the answer. So I wanted to, even at that stage, look at what, what there was that was being reflected back to her. Now, there was a very interesting thing at the end of the rape. At the end of the rape, this man who raped her put the blankets on her, went to the window, climbed through it again, and told her, close the window so no one can get in. Now ponder this, ponder this. 
here was this rapist who broke into her house, into her room, and here he was caring for her in a certain way and closed the window so no one could get in, so you're safe kind of thing. And we worked on that because that particular, that particular aspect would be the thing that would make her understand that that man that came into her room that night, who changed her whole life, actually was part of a beautiful being, but who got waylaid and, and encased in whatever his particular problem in life was, and now he was doing these kind of things to people. Maybe he'd had a bad motherhood, maybe he'd had, you know, maybe whatever. But what I was able to help her do was to actually forgive this person for what he did to her, because actually his, his, he wasn't evil as she, had, as she had portrayed in her mind. And it helped her immeasurably. It helped her immeasurably. Now, when we look at that, okay, we've got to understand that if we, are, if we stick to the tight identity, we are going to carry that pain all the time, all the time, all the time, which the masters, our teachers never do, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But what is really, really interesting in all of this is that if we can look at the totality of a being, we won't feel so bad for ourselves. It's really a very, very interesting thing. And we have to remember that in all our pain, the earthquakes, the floods, the wars, we are all in the right circumstances at the right time. And many people say to me, how can this be? And I say, because we haven't managed to leap beyond our relative lives in which karma operates due to the karmic imprints that we have created. And we are subject to where these imprints lead us. We haven't learned yet to overcome those imprints so that they don't lead us, that we lead them, we see them in a perspective. And this is the work that I'm shouting about. And when you die, this is so beautifully illustrated for you. Because when you die in the Bardos, the first, the best first prize in the Bardo of dying, that's the first Bardo, the best first prize is that you recognize your essence and you free yourself completely and totally. But you really need to be very aware to be able to do that. And most of us, most of us Sardian beings can't do that, not yet. Maybe some of you will be able to, but we can't do that yet. So the second prize, when we go into the Bardos, the second prize is the Bardo of Dharmata, where we start to recognize we know, recognize our true natures. Our true natures come before us. It's so funny in death because everything that's inside you is shown outside you just so that you can see it. But you've got to understand that what you're seeing outside when you are in a subtle body and you are going through death, what you see outside of you is really inside of you you're just able to have the insight to see it there so that you can recognize it. And in the second, the second prize is that you recognize this beautiful color, these, these magnificent colors, these magnificent um, real aspects when the deities come, the peaceful deities. They're not, they're not deities. They're your qualities. Number four, the qualities. They're your qualities showing themselves. They're your wisdoms presenting themselves to you. And if you can just say, ah, oh, I know that's where I belong. That's me. 
This is the me, the Melanie that was just in this incarnation is nothing. That's me. And I see it and I recognize it. And if you do in the second bardo, then you're free on a Samboka Kaya level. On that level, you're absolutely free. You do not have to come back. Whatever you need to do and whatever can be done from there, you recognize that that little identity is actually nothing at all. And this is who I really am. But if not, if you miss that, then third, let's not call it third prize, let's call it third bardo, not third prize. Because when you come to the third bardo, okay, and there is still a little chance for those of you who've gotten catapulted there, but who've done a lot of spiritual study, there's still a chance for you to liberate yourself at least a bit, definitely if you can get to David Chen. But, in that third bardo, the, called the bardo of becoming, now what we're seeing in front of us is not the true nature, but the true imprints of what we have done in the past. So all those imprints are there. Now think about it, okay? Think about those imprints, the strong ones. Let's say your name was... Vladimir Putin, and you're now reaching the bottom of becoming. Let's say your name was Hamas the king, or whatever the case is, and you come into the bottom of becoming. Let me tell you something. Those karmic imprints, and I know those karmic imprints are really hard to digest, okay? Because they're right in front of you. It's not that there's some god or somebody saying this is it. You see them. There is no way you can escape them in any way, okay? And wherever they catapult you, that is where you'll land up. And if it's to a hell realm, a hell realm is not a real realm. It's just your state of mind. Then a hell realm, that's where you'll be until you recognize. And so we have got another chance each time to clear these imprints. And I keep saying it to all of you over and over again, just have a look at your repetitive imprints. And we're going to look at the negative emotions, what they mean. If you've got a negative emotion that comes up a lot in your life, like fear, anxiety, um, anger, if any of these jealousy or doubt about everything, if you have a particular thing that keeps coming up in your life, or you have people in your life that keep showing you those kind of things, whatever you have in your life, now is the time. Now is the time not to feel sorry for yourself, not to feel you're a victim, but instead of feeling you're a victim, instead of, instead of identifying with this narrow, unhappy identity, Buddhism, Buddha, Buddha, not Buddhism, Buddha, offers a choice to you. Number one, you might even feel grateful that this is the chance to clear your imprint from this negative situation. Now, no, that's damn hard when you're dying of cancer or when you are, or when you're at a concert and somebody comes and shoots your best friend or shoots your husband or shoots them and they're all the dead bodies lying around, you, you, you definitely can't feel grateful. But at a later date, when all is said and done, and maybe solutions have come out, you may say to me what lots of people say to me, I'm so grateful now that that happened to me because I know that that was a turning point in my life. And so if it's a turning point, then the second thing Buddhism says is you have an amazing opportunity to exchange your temporary, dramatic role or identity into a spacious experience, identitylessness with your true nature central to your core like Guru Rinpoche 
and let that identity pain role dissolve completely as you become your true nature. Now, just one more thing, and then I'm really throwing it for discussion, and we'll do a meditation before we go to looking at how do you get that Buddha nature. Okay, but I just remember my conversation with Lama Yeshi Rinpoche on Holy Isle. I might have told you this before, but it's very appropriate now. He was telling us, he was sitting sometimes, if you got him in the mood on Holy Isle, because he used to relax on Holy Isle, he'd talk and talk and talk and teach. And then I was always aware of all the people. And when somebody would start asking these silly little questions, I would go, shh. Because, because I knew that if you distract him with your questions, he'll say, okay, good night, everybody. But if you know how to, how to pump him for the questions, which I always knew from all the years of being with him, you could keep him there teaching for hours, you know, which was so wonderful. Anyway, he told us one night, we were sitting around his feet about his growing up and all the problems that were in Tibet and all the difficulties that they had and all the pain and suffering that they went through when they went from Tibet to India and all the things that happened to them and all their stuff, you know, as they were growing up and there was often, you know, they were often poor, but they often had these wonderful families. And then when they left, they parted from their families. Some of them never, ever saw their families again, you know, when they parted, which I know has happened on many times on the earth plane. And also like in Akko Rinpoche and Lamieshi's Rinpoche's case, their family got tortured every Sunday because of their leaving, you know. The police used to go to their house and torture them every week because of the two of them leaving. And they knew about this. So... You can imagine how awful that is to think that because I left, the Chinese are going and torturing my parents because we managed to get out of Tibet. Anyway, he said, I do not have one trace of my traumas, not even of going through from India, from Tibet to India. I don't have a trace. Anyway, the next morning, Straight away, when I was going for one of my walks with him, I said, listen, I deal with people and their psychology and their pain. How did you do it? Come on. How do you guys get rid of all your pain and your trauma and all your absolute things? And he said, when you understand your true nature, all of that dissolves by itself. And he said, you with the, he was, he was actually saying, you let go of the karmic imprints because they dissolve. And it's kind of their culture. Like if somebody gives you a present that you love, I always take this as an example, you'll go to them a million times, still using your necklace, still using this, you'll thank them, or I love what you gave me. They never do. They say thank you to you, and then they never talk about it again. It's like that with their imprints. It just gets dropped. This is another permanent, this is another thing we do in the West. And Lamayeshi Rinpoche told me, if you have devotion and faith to the guru and the lineage, it doesn't matter if it's not a live guru, even if it's Guru Rinpoche, you have devotion and faith to the lineage, he said, it's really, really easy for it all to dissolve. And he's, and I'm saying to you, growing up in a Buddhist environment, their relationship with emotions is totally different to our relationship with emotions. I mean, we solidify it. We attach. We go on and on and on and on. And it's in, that's our ingraining. But they don't have that. They really don't stay on anything. They're gone. They're into the next thing. They never harp on anything. They never do and they never solidify. And they never attach to their temporary identities. Now, once I heard Ringu Toku talking about the refugee camps when they arrived in India. 
Oh my goodness. I don't know how they survived in those refugee camps. He said they went there, they, they had very little food. They had hard, most of them had left their parents behind. If they had any relatives, what they did was they took the sacks where they got their mealies and they tried to put like a curtain so they could have a little family life in, inside their curtains in the refugee camps. He said, and then there were these bed bugs. He said, the bed bugs bit you from top to toe from morning till night all the time. You could not get rid of those bed bugs for any money in the world. And he told me about the teasing that went on and the fighting and the things that happened in the, and I go like, how can you still be standing here teaching? But he laughs about it, like it's gone. Let me throw this open and then we'll do, because my next question is, so how do we really, really, in practical terms, get back to our Buddha natures? And that's what I'm going to teach you. But let me see if there's anything anyone wants to say. Sean, and I saw, I saw, uh, what's her name was here, but I don't know if she's still here. Let me just see. Tatiana, you also always have lots of questions. And Stephanie Moss, and Teresa, and Esty. Okay, I'm just looking at all who's here. <coughs> Any I'm all, yes, please. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on something you said earlier um, about sharing the land. And I just think this whole um, life experience and our existence, it, it's all a big test like, to see if we can all actually get on. Like we could all have been created white, black, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, gay, straight, whatever. But we're all so different. And it's, it's, it's a big test like a big conscious collective test, I believe. And, and what I think humanity for? is failing, like on failing a lot of the time. What's the test for, Sean? I mean, I, I don't want to sound trite and say like kindness and compassion and empathy, but I mean, I think those are the core values. Okay. But, yeah. but we've lost them, right? Um. I think we are losing in parts. Um, bad news sells. No one's reporting all the beautiful, good things that are happening every single day. That's um, true. There's a lot of really good things that people are doing every single day, but it doesn't sell. It's not salacious. It's not, um, yeah. True. That's that's just my opinion. But but yeah, I don't think we're doing very well collectively right now. I think you're right, and I think what you're saying is so important. And you see, these things come. Like so many people are going through so we could many. Have like, yeah, we could have all been the same and it would have been much easier, but it's not. <laughs> it's a test. But, but what about that we're not the same, but how do we share that absolute openness to include people that aren't the same as us? I mean, I look at people all the time and they're so different to me, but that's irrelevant. It's how you can see them. You know, they're diff only different to me because I'm, I'm going through a different kind of life to them or I've chosen to do a different life to them. But actually, we're all equal. So but that's also what magic happens where you learn. Yeah, but we should all be able to see each other's <coughs> good nature. And that's the point. When we see cruelty in the world, what has happened to people? What is Melanie? Happening? Yes, please, dummy. You also. Yeah. Um, I I just want to add uh, a few things. So you know, I come from Sri Lanka. I yeah. think it's so. We have Christians, Muslims, as well. Majority is Buddhist, but it's a cultural thing as well to right. share. So my husband's family so they are from UK English family but I see the difference um, I don't want to come this as like a criticism absolutely not. but, but the Asian Eastern countries it's just part of living this empathy we don't have to take such an effort 
feel someone's pain. It's 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 so normal. I, I don't want to sound arrogant, so I'm trying no, to. No, you're not sounding <laughs> arrogant. I get exactly. And also, it's not everyone like that. There are cruel people, fights, jealousy, anger, but majority of them, because maybe because most of the people are poor, so they feel the others pain so mm. i've been in africa for so long i really don't understand how people see the color i just don't understand i've been here like 20 years still my helpers gardener whoever i just don't see the difference i can I eat with them. I'm a bit emotional. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, and I, especially in Harare, Zimbabwe, there's nothing. People are suffering, but uh, it's just part of the culture, feelings. I, I don't know how to explain, but in Asian culture, there's that um, Buddhism, a lot to do with the Buddhism as well, I'm sure. But uh, we never we never say okay. I did the Christmas last year. This is an example. You do this year. I did no. We do when we can. If we can't, we are open about it. And you know about what you about said. presents. If you said uh, you talk about oh, I still wear this necklace away. When we receive a present, we never even open it in the pub. Like, it's not a big thing. We don't kind of expect. It's an embarrassment to open it and sort of, uh, that because it's a material thing. So yes. Yes. just move on. It's just something we appreciate, uh, but no attachment. And you know my life's story i mean how many houses they all almost forgotten at the time to leave all these houses and family members hard at the time the moment well you have i had to accept and here i am today yeah happy Listen, what you're saying is absolutely what i'm saying okay yeah the, Definitely, in a Buddhist culture, there is definitely, in fact, in an Asian culture, because, you know, it also, it also, I see it in India a lot, even where people are, are Hindu or whatever the case is, those cultures are different. And I feel sorry for us in the West, because how could we, how could we ever really change that when our mothers taught us? This is who you are. You fight for what you want. You know, you become something. You become successful. You do this. You do that. How do we? How do we change that? I see that in an Asian in an Asian culture. I see that. I told you last time when I see Zongsa Kienzi Rinpoche, this terrific master, teaching an Asian group or teaching um, a Canadian group. I mean, it's just chalk and cheese. You know, when the Asians come up to the microphone, they go, good evening, Rinpoche. They put their hands together. It's so wonderful that you're here and that we can receive these beautiful teachings. And then they ask the question. The Westerners come up and they go, Rinpoche, I need to challenge something that you're saying. And with our cultures, with our indoctrination with our emphasis on intellect. I mean, how is it that we've got to change and become gentle, caring, you know, part of a community people when we've been taught to be individuals? And, you know, Zong Saki Enzi Rinpoche says, even with this thing called individual rights, you know, human rights, he says, we have to be careful with human rights because human rights become absolutely dogmatic. And then in the end, they just become an alternative to the dogma of what people are, what, you know, what they're trying to get rid of the oppression. So our intellectual minds really 
hold us back a lot, you know? And, and it's really hard to decondition that. I mean, I know I was brought up in a home where, where, you know, when we had a Sunday and my uncles came for lunch and that kind of thing, they were all doctors and lawyers and all these kind of people and everything. And only if you had some something really worthy to say, could you be heard at a Sunday lunch table? You know, you had to say something quite profound, otherwise you were just drowned out. There wasn't that kind of thing. That's the culture I was brought up in. So it's really difficult when I hear the masters saying this as to how we can do it. We taught, you did this wrong to me, I'm going to sue you. Nobody says, let me see what this wrong is doing. Maybe it's an amazing opportunity for me to set the karmic imprint right. It's very deep and very painful. And what I wrote down for all of you is the exact practical path of how to start Waking up the Buddha nature within you, waking it up. How can we start? How do we see it? I wrote this all down for you so that I can really read. Yes, Mark, please go for it. Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, because uh, I work in shipping, right? <laughs> I, um, I, I think what 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 I wanted to say is I have a. I know what you what what we what we are talking about, but generally, I do not think that the Western and the Eastern are so different. I, I really, I mean, I I, I know what I, I hear you, but you know, we're looking at, at terrible things maybe happening with China and Taiwan. We're looking at North Korea. We're not looking at certain Japanese things. Uh, you know, we all you can. I don't think we. You know, and the Germans have done terrible things, and the, the the Spanish have done terrible things, and all that. So I I don't think I think actually what what and maybe that's that's a good thing um, about the subject matter of 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 this evening. I, I think we're doing exactly that. We 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 just falling into an identity. So it doesn't matter if you're a Hindu from Sri Lanka or if you are a, a cold Scot or a, a, I don't know what. I think the, the the thing is, and we don't have to, we don't have to all mingle and be wonderful friends and drink together, or I don't know what. That I don't think that is what it is. It's more like that we accept and and find some love and compassion for each other, and say, so, well, you know what, I, you are like a human being, like I am, no matter where you're from, no matter where I'm from, you know, I like you a lot, but. You know, for the next 10, 20 years, we don't see each other because our culture is different. It's true what you're saying, but you see, that is how these wars have come about. Because yeah, sure. of dogmatic identities and their dogmatic belief systems and everything. And I'm trying to say, what is this nature? which is not for Asians or Buddhists or anything. I mean, you can take the word Buddha out of it and call it awakened nature. It's in Judaism, it's in Christianity, it's in absolutely every culture is the awakened nature. And that's what we've got to find. Let's just do a quick meditation and, okay. let's, and then we'll just look at that Buddha nature and I'll start you in the meditation with it, okay? So just breathe in and breathe out. And as you breathe out, just let that identity go. Let it be. It's only there to serve you and take you through this journey of life. And when we come to the portal of death, all of that dissolves. I want you to imagine the skandhas dissolving at death. Form, totally dissolving. You've got to leave it behind. And all the people in their forms that you love. 
feelings. There's not one of them that are solid or permanent or real. Perceptions, all the perceptions of our life, how we saw things, what we saw, how we believed in them, all our perceptions, they all dissolve at death. Our habits, the things we do every day, the things we practice every day, the things we are every day, our habitual momentum, it all falls away at that moment. Consciousness, our sense consciousnesses, our mind consciousnesses, how we, how we label things, how we saw things, right at that moment of death, they all dissolve. And we are standing naked, absolutely, in essence. Maybe the thought goes through our mind, why did I cultivate all of that? What I should have cultivated was this pure essence. And out of the essence, the continual expression, that's all that counts when we first die. So let's take time to understand how the kayas and the wisdoms operate within us so that they are easily recognizable at death. Just right now, let everything in your life just be your trials, your tribulations, your feelings, your angers, just let them all dissolve in front of you. Come up and dissolve and just see impermanence in everything in this life. Feel the peace <clears throat> when you allow everything to be let go of your being. Just feel that peace and confidence that there's something there that will never die. And we need to become aware of it at all times. Not hang on to all the small identity. I just want to talk for five minutes on that Buddha nature and then we can go back to it again because I really think it's so important. You know, if we look at Buddha nature and what it really means, it's essence, 
essence is your core. It's emptiness. It's spacious. It's clear light. You could call it anything. We all made of the essence. That's our base. And from the essence comes, that's the, called the Dharmakaya. From the essence comes the expression, the nature, which is part of the essence. But the essence expresses it. It's the nature. It's luminosity. It's clarity. The way the world should be expressed out of the out of the essence is like that. And that's how the nature is. And if we could see the world like the Buddha saw the world, it wouldn't be this ugly warring. It would be a beautiful Buddha land. And so the essence and the nature, which is called the Sambhokakaya, and the third kaya is called the near manakaya. And the near manakaya is the unlimited expression of compassion. That's what Damika was talking about. The unlimited expression of compassion. Now, when you understand these three, that's what you compiled of. Your essence, the nature, and the expression. That's who we are. And whatever gets expressed, whatever goes out, comes back into the essence, dissolving. So even if we're going through any trauma, it will express itself and then it will come back into the pure, pure essence. When we trust that, that's the first thing of that we are made of enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind which are what we are the essence of. That's how it, we are expressed. And secondly, the five wisdoms, okay? The five wisdoms, which is really important, how do they work? If we've got the five wisdoms, why can't we see them? Why can't we go into a shop and buy them? Why can't we understand them? Why can't we live with them? Why can't they be part of what we are doing? Well, if we look at them, it's very, very interesting because all our negative emotions, which we look at, they are all really wisdoms, primordial consciousnesses, okay? And you've got to know those five so well that you know them like the back of your hand. You mustn't have to read them up. You must know them. So that when the negative poisons come up, you can really start seeing them as wisdoms. It's really important. If you know that you've got the three bodies and you know that you've got the five wisdoms. So how do we do this? How does it work? It must be in the palm of your hand. Well, what the Buddha taught was there are five main poisons. Okay, five main negative emotions. But... If you look at those negative emotions, there are lots and lots and lots of emotions that come out of that one emotion. So that one emotion symbolizes the main one. So let's look at the first one, anger and aggression. Okay, but anger and aggression has got lots of other emotions that come out of it that fit there. Grudges, hurt, hatred, of grievances, frustrated, irritation, and most important, depression. Did you know that most angry people show the anger on top, but underneath there's a lot of hurt and often a lot of depression, which gets covered over by the anger. So Anger and aggression is your one thing, but depression definitely fits there. So does frustration, so does irritation, so does hurt. All those things fit in with anger. So anger is one. We'll go into them in more detail next time. Ignorance and delusion. Ignorance is ignoring the truth. It doesn't mean that you didn't go to school. It means you ignore the truth. Ignorance and, del and delusion. Delusion is when you say, yeah, well, this happened because of this. And this is not really true. And this is like this. And you like this because we tell ourselves these deluded stories all 
the time, all day long. Ignorance and delusion with all our stories. But the emotions attached to that are inadequacy, uncertainty, confusion, doubt, bewilderment. Those are all the emotions that go with ignorance and delusion. Just briefly, the third one is pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance is such an important thing because from pride and arrogance, you subjugate others. And that's the feeling is, I'm entitled to. You are less and I'm entitled to. Okay, so all of those subjugation, um, pretentiousness, I mean, pretentiousness comes with the arrogance, unyielding, it's my way or the bar way, you can go and jump in the lake, pride goes with all those kind of emotions, and the fourth one is craving, attachment, grasping, desire, okay, and those go with yearning, lack of confidence, and sometimes anxiety. Because the more anxious you are, the more you grasp, the more you crave, the more you want people to give you attention, the more you hold on to things. So all those emotions along those lines go with craving and attachment. And the fifth one is envy and jealousy. Now, I mean, some people are so jealous they do not understand that people get people do things because they've earned the right to do them very often. But there's so much jealousy and envy. Then comes with that also inadequacy, competitiveness, pain, untrusting. All those emotions come with it. So the five main ones are anger, ignorance, delusion, pride or arrogance, craving or attachment and grasping envy and jealousy. Those are the five. Now, just very briefly before you go, and then let's really do some exercises in this next week, and let's really look at how they are, because each one of those poisons is really a wisdom or a primordial consciousness. So in other words, what it's like is this. If I take this, and I say, this is a bowl, okay? So this is my anger. But this same bowl, if I turn it around like that, it is something else. Now I can balance something on it. It's a completely different thing. Now, if you take the anger and you really look deeply at that anger, it will be mirror-like wisdom, okay? So any anger that you have or that somebody has for you is really mirror-like wisdom. The mirror says it all. Hey, I had a little accident the other day. I was driving along going to park my car and this guy just reversed out, you know, out of the parking lot like that. I didn't see him reversing. I went straight into him, okay? So I'm getting out of the car and I'm going to say, can't you look when a car's coming and everything? Instead of, he's got this whole story in his head. He says to me, you were speeding. I said, speeding along the parking lot. I just came in from the parking lot at the harbor. I was speeding. He said, yes. And I've got witnesses to see that you were speeding. And I said, just give me your details and what insurance. He wasn't insured, so you could already see his whole story was coming out, you know, and what he's done since then. But the bottom line is, who is this angry person that is in front of me, shouting at me when he reversed into me? Who is this angry person for me? I need to look at this as mirror-like wisdom because it's reflecting something of one of my karmic imprints. And when this is what I want us to explore next time. I want us to explore this, how it actually works. Because just to go through them for tonight, and we must end, ignorance and delusion, when you turn it over, it's the wisdom of action, 
not of action accomplishment, of a, the wisdom of Dharma Datu, the wisdom, the absolute spacious wisdom. If you don't understand it, you'll be ignorant or deluded, but it's right there. Pride and arrogance is the wisdom of equality. The truth is what Eugene was saying earlier. The truth is that actually nobody, we're all the same. We've all got Buddha nature. So is the end. When the end runs away from me, when I touch it, we've all got Buddha nature. So we're all equal. We're just on different parts of the wheel of life, acting out different things. And But really, the wisdom of equality is there. When we have craving, attachment, and grasping, the wisdom is the discerning, discriminating wisdom. It's the wisdom that we have, instead of hanging on to everything and wanting it to be in a particular way, the wisdom of discernment or the discriminating wisdom allows us to see things in their truth. What is relative and what is ultimate, we can see it. So we're no longer hanging on for dear life to whatever it is we've got. And finally, the envy and jealousy. People are always envious and jealous of other people that do well or do better than them. But that is the action accomplishing wisdom. The action accomplishing wisdom says men are the highest branches of the tree in a golden age because they are at the top because they've got everything. They've, they've gone to that level. You don't have to be jealous of them. They will help you. But instead, we've got envy and jealousy. Now, the whole thing is when you really learn to know these, it's the most amazing, amazing thing. Because even when I got out of the car with this accident and I saw this guy ranting and raving at me, I was already thinking about mirror-like wisdom. I was also thinking, shit, my car's got a lot of damage, you know. But I was also thinking, who is he? Who is he? You know, you're still going to think of the, of the relative side. But who's this guy? How did he come into my life? For what reason? What did we have together once? You know, why is he bashing me? And when I look inside me, maybe there were angers inside me that needed to be subdued. And that's what he was there for. And that's what the crash was there for. Now, when you start to be able to apply it, then when death's door comes, it's so easy to go to who you really are. Just ponder it. And then next week, I will eventually get to James Lowe's thing because he's got beautiful teaching, but it doesn't matter because I felt that I needed to do this tonight, to talk about the imprints, to talk about how they come about, to talk about the spacious identity versus the tight identity or identitylessness. So I'll stay to take questions from anybody that really wants to, but I... I, I think it's really important. And I've got to tell you that on my computer today, I suddenly noticed a on, on the Zoom, AI companion. I don't want an AI companion. I didn't get on my computer. Have anybody got that on their computer? Yes, AI? no, it's, 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 a, it's for everybody. It's not just, yeah. <laughs> Okay. But do you have to have an AI companion when you've got it, Fee? <laughs> no, not necessarily. No, it's just the, you know, the whole hype around AI at the moment and things like that. And if you're into it and you can use it in different ways, I haven't investigated it yet, but it's, you don't have to use it. Well, please tell me what it is so that I, I, I tried to delete it. It wouldn't go away, you know. <laughs> so I mean, it, it could, It's probably something that will, you know, um, uh, take notes for you uh, it's a bit like transcription and things like that and probably set up dates and things automatically for you and all that sort of I don't know I haven't investigated it on Zoom as yet all I want to know is does the AI companion know the wisdoms no it doesn't 
<laughs> Educate for everybody and then I'll take any questions you really need because there's a lot to digest. But let's okay. really dedicate. See, I did make you again in case Please. you wish. Okay, thanks. So let's just dedicate to all Sondian beings and particularly to the hostages in Israel, to the, the soldiers who are obviously going to go in by foot and, and have this horrendous war, and to all those in the wars and in the wars in Ukraine and the victims and the bereaved and everybody, may they get something out of this teaching and out of our medicine Buddha practice. Through this merit, may we achieve all-seeing Buddhahood, and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Sonam die tamche zipane, topne nepe dranam pamshene, jega na chibala topaye, sipe sole duwa drowarsho.